Okay, welcome back. We're going to be talking about in this uh, uh, fourth uh, PowerPoint video on uh, on cells, uh, one area that we haven't really discussed much, and that's called cell division. Okay, um, and it, it will, we, it's going to involve a little bit of DNA discussion, but we'll be talking a lot more about the specifics in regards to uh, DNA expression and uh, reproduction with of the DNA in a later uh, PowerPoint video. But let's just talk a little about cell division itself. Okay, and what cell division is and how what occurs and so forth. Well, cell division or cytokinesis, uh, cytokinesis um, is a situation where one cell then may become two. Okay, um, that the cell we have we have, it involves uh, the the division of not only the cytoplasm but the nuclear material, and that's going to be important. Okay, there are actually two types of cell division that we have to think about. The first one's called somatic cell division, and the process of somatic cell division is also called mitosis. And this is where one cell becomes two, and each uh, cell that's that's made the two cells that made from the, that came from the one cell each has all of those will have the 23 pairs of chromosomes which will be identical from one cell to the other cell okay and that's called somatic uh, cell division or the process of mitosis. Another type of cell division we have is called reproductive cell division or also the function of, of that would be meiosis where this is actually a reduction division okay where what happens is this is where we have to deal with spermatozoa and ovum okay ovum the female quote gamete gamete means the sex cell this female gamete would be the ovum the male gamete would be the spermatozoa if I had 23 pairs of chromosomes in the male gamete, the spermatozoa, and 23 pairs of chromosomes in the female gamete, the ovum, and they met and fertilized united, then they'd have 46 pairs of chromosomes. Way too many, okay? So the idea is when the gametes are made, they undergo what's called a reduction division, where one half of each pair of the chromosomes is put into each spermatozoa or ovum. So, so each gamete, therefore, has one half of each pair of 23rd 23 pairs of chromosomes, okay? So as a result, what happens is when one half of each pair from the spermatozoa and one half of the pair from the ovum meet, now all of a sudden, voila, I have a complete uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes. Half from the mom, half from the dad. Half from each one of the chromosomes from the dad, half from each one of the chromosomes from the mom. And that's called reproductive cellular division or reduction division or by the function of what we call meiosis. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that, so What's that? Oh, you want a little bit more information? Of course. Let me give you a little bit more information what we're talking about. <clears throat> Let's go back and talk about somatic for just a minute. Again, mitosis. And this is an equal division of the cell. So we start out with one parent cell. And one parent cell will undergo a process where what happens, it divides and all of a sudden creates two daughter cells. If I look at those daughter cells, they have the same identical genetic information as the parent. And that's where we'll talk a little about what happens in the nucleus and all that magic that occurs in the case of my, my, mitosis. This is used for an increase in the number of cell when it's needed, such as in growth repair. You know, their body's constantly replaced placing various types of cells throughout the body. And as you're sitting there, I'm sure a few cells are divided during the course of the time we've, we start talking here. So for basically for growth and repair, we have what's called somatic cell division, which is the process of mitosis. Uh, reproductive cell division, or that reduction division, or meiosis, um, is again where what happens is during they is, is two sets of nuclear division. So as a result, what, what eventually happens is the spermatozoa will have one half of each of those pairs of chromosomes. So chromosome one through chromosome 23, you have half of each of those, well, half of each pair in the, same, in, the, in the spermatozoa and half of each pair in the, in the ovum. So as a result, what happens is when they come together and they merge and they fertilize uh, in the fallopian tube usually, which we'll talk about later on in the semester, when they fertilize inside the fallopian tube, now I take one half of the pair from the spermatozoa, one half of the pair that was from the parent from the, from the ovum, they mix it and now I have 23 pairs, a full 23 pair complement of uh, chromosomes uh, that allows re genetic recombination. And what I mean by recombination is it's a mixing of the half of each pair from the dad, half of each pair from the mom, and all of a sudden the offspring has genetic uh, influence from both the mom and the dad. Okay, and that would be called recombination. So that's a little about that. Now, I guess you're, gonna, you're sitting there saying, you know, I, 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 I can, I, if, I, if I'm constantly 
making any cells are dividing, I should be getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, that's one of the things we talk about growth. And that growth occurs to a certain area, a certain time, certain age in life. And all of a sudden, uh, certain cells become affected differently because you know what? Not all cells divide. Okay, some cells get to a certain point and they never divide again. They're there. The only thing that happens is if something, if they're damaged, they may be replaced. And what we find as people get older, their cell divisions become less and less and less. And that's why certain things uh, start to deplete as people get older, such as muscle mass. Okay, so we have what are called differentiated cells. Okay, uh, blood cells are differentiated cells. A number of cells are quote, called differentiated cells. And what we, what we mean by a cell that's differentiated, it starts out as maybe a stem cell, something very early and very primitive. And as they get older, what will happen is that is they go through various stages where they where they go from like, you know, in a person, you go from a, a neonate, a newborn to a infant to, a, you know, a toddler to a child to a, um, a bratty teen to a high school to, you know, uh, adolescent, you know, on and on and on, finally to become an adult. Well, what happens is cells do the same thing. They go through a maturation process. And during this maturation process, they finally get to sometimes to a point during this point of maturation process, which is called differentiation. So differentiation, when you see the word differentiate, that's what that means. So when we get to a certain level of differentiation, they stop being able to divide, okay? Uh, so after a certain point of maturation, after a certain point of differentiation, they don't divide anymore. Some examples of those are nerve cells, neurons, okay? You can't replace your neurons. Once they're there, they're there, you know, and that's it. Uh, I know when they talk about spinal cord injuries, you know, one of the problems with spinal cord injuries is because neurons can't replace themselves, particularly the axon area, which is the long thread-like area. So what happens is if they have a severed spinal cord because of a cervical injury or a back injury that it does on the spinal cord, you know, your result in that paralysis. And up until, you know, um, people start thinking, well, how can we actually get around that? You know, they start to talk about things like using stem cells, you know, and if they could find a way to use stem cells and put stem cells in that area where the gap is, maybe they'll be able to regenerate some nerves. Uh, they'll, they'll cross that bridge that might re return some function. But uh, neurons are one of those cells that really don't divide. Same thing with muscle, you know, skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. Once you get to a certain point, basically what you got is what you got. The muscle cells you have now are the same muscle cells you've had for a, a darn long time because they're not changing. They're not dividing. They're, they're there, okay? Uh, they will become destroyed over a period of time. And then what happens if they are destroyed or if there's damage, then what happens, it's not really a division, but they have to actually have to find a way to make new ones from from scratch, you know, so that's one thing. Also, like I said, blood cells. If I look at in the bone marrow, okay, bone marrow cells are constantly replenishing cells, are constantly dividing in regards to what we call bone marrow stem cells. And these stem cells will have to divide. Why? Because only about one to two percent of my bone marrow stem cells, okay, our bone marrow cells are stem cells. About one to two percent of the cells in my bone marrow are stem cells. So they constantly have to be dividing to make more stem cells because what happens is that stem cell could become a red cell, it could become a white cell, or it could become a platelet, depends upon what the influence is, okay? But once it gets to this red cell, this red cell starts to go down this differentiation line, and the white cell starts to go down this differentiation line, and the platelet starts to go up, they can't divide anymore, okay? So the stem cell can divide to be able to replenish the red cell, white cell, and platelet. But once I get to a certain point in that division where it's either become a red cell, white cell, or platelet, guess what? It stops dividing, okay? So some cells don't really divide. What you have is what you, what, what you, what you, have is what you got, and that's it. You know, utilize it the best way you can. On the other hand, some cells become very actively dividers, such as the gut epithelial cells, so the cells that line my esophagus and the intestines and my stomach and all those things. Those cells are replacing over and over and over and over very fast. Also, epidermal cells. We're constantly shedding cells from the outside, and the basement layer or the bottom almost layer where the, where the epidermis starts, these cells are dividing to be able to replace what we're losing on a daily basis. So let me give you a few there. I'll flip a few cells off for you and basically uh, uh, sort of gross, wasn't it? Yeah, I was. I probably shouldn't have done that. What happens is we're constantly shedding cells everywhere we're going, okay? Uh, you go to a restaurant, guess what? You sit down there, you know, hopefully they wipe the table because what happens is the person before you, they may have left a lot of their epi epidermal cells just sitting there, okay? Also, those bone marrow cells have to be constantly uh, they replace very actively or they divide very actively. The interesting thing about this, when I look at cells that divide very actively, they have an increased risk of developing things like cancer.
cancers. Why? Because there's probably some, there's a, a greater chance of some type of, a, of an abnormal cell division that will occur. I know when they talked about, um, uh, when they used a, 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 a atomic bomb in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and stuff like that, people had significant problems. A lot of it were GI related cancers that would develop because of that high dose of radiation. Why? Because these epithelial cells are replacing, are, re are you know, are, are dividing fast and the radiation has a greater effect on rapidly dividing cells. Same thing, they end up with a lot of types of leukemias and stuff like that. Why? Because the bone marrow cells, the stem cells in the bone marrow are rapidly dividing and as a result because of that, those were much more likely to develop some type of a cancer because again the cancer develops in, 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 the, in the case of radiation with rapidly dividing cells. That's why they worry about the fetus. You know, when the fetus, when, when, a, when a mom is pregnant and the fetus gets exposed to the radiation, you know, um, the cells, because they're rapidly dividing, there's all kinds of damage that you do to those cells, okay? So that's a little bit about who divides. If we look at this chart right here, this chart's a little bit misleading in some ways. You look at some of these cells, you know, it says the this, this small uh, intestine epithelium you has a turnover rate of about two to four days. Same thing with the stomach, stomach about two to nine days. That's why people when they have ulcers, if you decrease the st decrease the stimulus as to why the ulcer's there by decreasing like gastric acid and stuff like that, you know, most of these ulcers will probably heal. Uh, blood neutrophils. And the reason why they do that is not because the neutrophil or the one of the one type of a, the most common type of white cell, it's not because of that replacing, but the stem cells. Okay. So when we look at down these down these things. Uh, one thing down here, let's see, uh, uh, skeletal nervous system. Oh, what does it say? lifetime. In other words, what you got is what you got. This, the lens of your eye doesn't change. Uh, the, the ovum, uh, think about female ovum. Is the ovum you get at the beginning is what you end up with at the end. Okay. I mean, you use them up, obviously females will, will use them up during the course of, of ovulation and, uh, um, you know, um, going through a cycle on a monthly basis once they get past puberty. But what happens is females are born with a certain number of ovum and guess what? They don't, they don't divide. They don't replenish themselves. Male, the spermatozoa can actually uh, replenish themselves for a lifetime. But in the ovum, they have a, the females will have a certain set number of ovum that they have. And once they're gone, they're gone. You know, you can't, they're not going to divide. And those aren't dividing. They're, constant, they're not constantly replacing themselves. They just have a certain complement. And once they're gone, they're gone. Okay. So this just tells a little bit about how things are actually uh, reproduced and turned over and stuff like that. And the same thing over here, just in a little different way, looking at things. Okay. A little about, you know, skin cells are replaced every 20, 39 days. Uh, you know, visual cortex stops growing when you're born and stuff like that. Uh, again, and it talks about things like heart muscle cells stops growing, you know, at a certain age. We start, we stop cell dividing. We're going to have cell division in certain things like skeletal muscle, heart muscle, and stuff like that for a period of time, just because it has to get larger in size. So we're going to have cell division as things start to get larger in size, but at a certain point it stops. Okay. And again, like the Achilles tendon stops growing when you're 17 years of age, you know, uh, and uh, uh, pancreatic beta cells, which make the insulin in your pancreas, they stop growing at about 30 years of age. So what hap happens is some cells are turning over fast. Some cells are turning over very slow. And some cells after a certain point, they don't turn over at all. They're not growing. They're not multiplying. They're not dividing at all. Okay. So that's what we talk about. Okay. Because again, the idea is that if we, if we lose cells, you have to have something to replace it. And you replace that by cell division. But again, some things did, will not, the cells don't get, don't get replaced because some, some of these cells have a, have a, have a, a, a very long long longevity, longevity, nerve cells, they're there for the duration, muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells, they're there for the duration, okay, where other things have to be constantly replaced, like the linings of the mouth, the linings of the gut and stuff like that, you know how you bite, you, you bite your cheek or something like that, you got that little wound, and about three or four days, best, guess what, you don't feel it anymore, it's gone, okay, because those cells are constantly turning over, there's a rapid re reproduction rate in those particular cells, okay, now, Let's get into the nitty gritty of what cell division really is. Cell division is divided into two large portions. One's called interface, okay, interface. And that's a big, the biggest portion. If we look at here, this is the whole interface all out here. That's all interface. And that's two things. Number one, it's the majority of the time. Most cells that you have in your body are in interface, okay? And some cells, 
stay in interface for a lifetime. Muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells, they're always in interface. They never leave interface. Why? Because they don't divide after a certain period of time. Okay. Also in this interface, interface the time they're preparing for division. Okay. Particularly in this S phase, which is the middle of that interface, uh, where the where the DNA, okay, or the chromosomes are multiplying or reproducing themselves. And then finally later during, during this whole interface, all those little organelles that we talked about before, they're multiplying. We're making more organelles. So what happens is when we finally divide into that two cells, each cell will have an, uh, an acceptable number of, of, of organelles. But what happens, the, 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 the interesting thing about it is, is, again, some interface is very long in some uh, things, such as a lifetime in skeletal muscle and a nerve, and some things are very short in that interface, such as in that lining of the gut you know, the intestines and stuff like that. The minimum time is usually about 19 hours. It's, it's about the minimal time that you have for this interface. And basically what mostly happens during this time is, this is normal everyday today activity. Just go to work the same way every day, do the same thing, and that's what the cell is doing during the majority of this interface, okay? What happens is the small portion of what we have out here is basically the what we what we call the M phase, and the M phase is out here, okay? And the M phase is that division phase, okay, or that mitosis phase or mitotic phase. And there are a number of phases and number of things that happen. We'll talk about each of those phases. We have a, what's called a prophase, which is the beginning, okay? And then we have a metaphase, which follows prophase, an anaphase, which follows metaphase, and a telophase, which follows anaphase, and then and after the telophase, we go back to interface again, okay? And we'll talk about each of those individually, okay? So that's the interface, and there's my, go ahead, there's my M phase, or my, you know, my tonic phase, okay? And again, if I look at this sort of like this diagram up here, it tells a little about what's going on. I could sort of divide this growth right here. Anything up in here would be interface, even though it's a smaller portion of the chart. This down here would be my, my M phase or my mitotic phase. A lot more things are happening. We'll talk about each of those things, what they happen in each of those phases. Let's just talk about and break those down now uh, to get down to the nitty gritty. Again, that cell cycle is a minimum of, of, of eight of 19 hours. And, it's, and in many cells, it's more than that. When you look at that rapidly dividing cells, like that we talked about, like the bone marrow stem cells and the, you know uh, epithelial cells and, and the skin or epidermal cells, excuse me, and the epithelial cells are the ones that line the inside of the gut. It's, it's a very short time, at least a minimum of 19 hours and stuff like that. And then, then most of the other cells are much longer than that. Uh, but the interface, which is that resting phase, that portion we talked about here is a minimum of 18 hours. So if we looked at a 19 hour cycle, one hour would be for the M phase and about 18 hours would be for the interface. But that's only just, it's not all cells, there's very few cells that are like that. We're just looking at the M phase is very short. The uh, interface could be quite, quite, quite long. Or like I say, some cells are permanently stuck in interface, less skeletal muscle and, and neurons, uh, nerve cells, okay? Um, and what happens is in, in a couple things are going on. Now, I'm going to let you in a little secret, okay? I want to get, get, get really close. Oop, I just dropped my, my pen, okay? A couple things, I, I want you to get really close. Let me pick up my pen here. A couple things I want you to get really close because I want to tell you a little about this really close, okay? We talk about the chromosomes being in that X shape, okay? Most of the time, they're not. Most of the time, they're not in that's called the dyad structure, okay? Most of the time, they're not. Most of the time, they sit as uncoiled strands in the nucleus. And what happens is when you, if, if, if you were going to look at a cell underneath the microscope, when you look at the nucleus, the nucleus looks very clumpy. You don't see these little X's all over the place. That X doesn't mark the spot all over the nucleus, okay? What happens, you see all these clumps, okay? And these clumps are actually called chromatin, okay? And the chromatin are basically the DNA and, this, and the chromosomes have uncoiled, okay? And they've uncoiled, and they uncoiled for a reason. What happens is by uncoiling them, it allows access to the genes. And what do the genes do? They have a code as to how to make proteins. So as a result, what happens is these, these chromosomes start to unwind in, unwind in this interface, and they sit as sort of like an amorphous mass inside the, the, the nucleus, and it just allows access, it allows uh, uh, to be able to get the material, and we'll talk about the complex manner, how that happens in an upcoming video. It, it allows the uh, this process to be able to read the code 
okay, or transcribe the code and then translate the code to make a protein, it just allows more access to it, okay? Uh, nuclear division is usually about one hour. We talked about that. So that's that. Um, so what really happens in this interface, the big important thing, is number one, first of all, what does the interface, I like this, you know, a do list growth, DNA replication and general cell processes. And the majority of the time, there's probably still general cell processes. So that DNA, instead of being in that typical X formation that we know and love and we think that is there all the time, they do, it's not, okay? And what happens is the DNA in the nucleus uncoils. And again, it allows the genes to be exposed so they could do their work, okay? Okay, so it's not in that. And the term for that is chromatin. The chromatin is what we see. So if you looked at the nucleus, and if you you know, I'll, I'll be if, in the lab. There'll be some some cells that you'll see and nuclei. And if you look at the nuclei, you don't see that chromosomal X pattern, but you see sort of like a clumpy, bumpy, lumpy, bump, clumpy thing in there. And again, that that's the, called the chromatin. Okay. And this is for protein synthesis to occur. It allows the access of the genes because the genes have the code to make a protein. Okay. What we also find in inter interface is the organelles double in number. Okay, the organelles double. The idea is, um, if I want to make two cells, I have to increase the product that I'm turning out. Okay, so as a result, uh, you know, all these organelles that we talked about, mitochondria, the uh, endoplasmic reticulum, the, you know, everything else, the Golgi, uh, the, the ribosomes, they have to increase. So that what happens is now when they divide, there's, a num there's enough of each to go for each cell. Okay, we also find in a significant portion in that, even though it's not the majority of the time, is we have what's called the S phase. And the S phase is this little chunk right here. Okay, and the S phase is where the DNA replicates itself so that each daughter cell, will have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and that's called the S phase. We'll be talking more about how the DNA um, replicates itself, again, in an upcoming discussion, an upcoming video, which is actually, it sounds like it's really hard, but it's actually relatively simple if you look at it. I know the first time you listen, listen to it and you think about it, you say, oh my gosh, where did that, I mean, it's crazy. But on the other hand, if you listen to it three or four times, guess what? All of a sudden it makes sense. It just, it just sort of falls in place, okay? So that's pretty much what we see in, in, in um, interface. Now this is just looking at the, uh, the nucleus of a particular cell. So obviously this is the nucleus. We could see a double layered nuclear membrane Around the outside, you see the nuclear pores, like we talked about in a previous lecture. This right here would be the area of the nucleolus, okay? And what's the nucleolus doing? Making ribosomes, and the ribosomes are for what? Making protein. But if we look at the nucleus here, it's all a little clumpy bumpy, okay? And all the stuff, little clumps of stuff all over the place. And basically, all that is, is DNA material, but it's the DNA the chromosomes have unwind. Now, what happens, is, so this this is the uncoiled chromosomes that we see as this material called chromatin, and it's what we see almost the whole time through interface. You don't see any of that X-shaped chromosome, like I said, okay? And the chromosomes are unpacked to allow access to the genes, like I've mentioned a million times before. And so it sort of allows the nucleus is to be divided into different sections okay it's not like randomly just though just just throw those chromosomes out where they want but what happens it's not totally random but they have what's called a chromosomal territory so what happens is a certain area of, of the nucleus will be will be uh, a certain chromosome another area of the nucleus will be another chromosome a certain area of the nucleus will be another chromosome new certain area of the nucleus will be another chromosome so they have a no chromosomal uh, territory. Okay, what's going to eventually happen at the interface and go at the, at the at the end of interface and going into that first stage of mitosis, which is prophase. All of a sudden, you'll see these clumps of chromatin start to merge together. They start to come together. They start to join, and all of a sudden, they do form eventually during mitosis that X-shaped chromosomal pattern that we see and know and love. Okay, we think that it's in all time, but it's only a very short period of time while the cells there. Most of the chrome, most of the cells that you look at underneath the microscope will have a nuclear pattern that looks exactly like this with all this this all this chromatin material and the chromatin material is just the nuclear material but it's unwound just to allow better use. It allows you know, you know it's sort of like a, um, you know some people will buy like a, 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 you know tons of packs of something like that and they just all throw them in a drawer. Guess what? You can't use them when they're in a drawer and they're still wrapped in cellophane. So what happens is instead of leaving those things wrapped in cellophane in a drawer, what happens in the nucleus? They unwrap the cellophane. It's really not cellophane, but they unwrap them and allow that allow the chromosomes to spread out a little bit, and that allows the the, the genes to be exposed so they could do their work a little bit better. Okay, and they could read the read the code off the off the off the chromosomes a bit better. Okay, uh, so that's what we talked about. So not typical. So we have three phases, like I talked about: the G1 phase. 
whoops, the G1 phase. The G1 phase is called, G1 stands for, for, for first gap or gap one, okay? And basically what happens here is normal cell activities, doing what they normally do every day of the week, okay? You know, they get up every day and say, oh, what are we gonna do today? Oh, the same thing as yesterday, same thing, and they do the same thing, okay? So daily metabolic activities are done in this G1 phase, okay? And again, what happens is nerve and muscle cells, like I talked about before, these differentiate cells, what happens is they never leave this phase. They like this phase, they say, hey, you know what? I'm happy being like this, and they never leave this, okay? And what happens if there is a damage to something like that, stem cells will go to that area to be able to make some new cells. So basically, they stay in that for their entire lifetime, just about, okay? So that's called the G1 phase, okay? S phase is the period of DNA synthesis or replication. So what do we have? We have 20, most, and again, this could be a very, this G1 can be very long. Uh, what happens is everything's happening normally. Uh, chromatin, not X-shaped chromosomes and stuff like that. In the S phase, what happens is the DNA is being synthesized or replicated. Okay, it's, they actually start to read it. Okay, so they're starting to say, you know what? We're gonna divide sooner or later in certain cells. Again, not muscle, not nerve. Those other tissues we talked about, lens, the eye, stuff like that, it's not gonna happen. And other cells after a certain age, they stop doing that. They stay in, in the G1 phase. What happens is they say, in other cells that are, re that are replacing themselves, like the lining of the gut and stuff like that, and the epidermal cells and the skin and stuff like that, and the, and the bone marrow stem cells, like we talked about before. What happens is they say, you know what? We're gonna be making more cells. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, follow our contract and we're gonna just make more cells. So we're gonna divide. So what they're doing, and then in the G2 phase, they're actually getting in preparation. They're starting to get things lined up and get things ready together. Sort of like before graduation, you say, okay, you get in that line, you get in that line, you get in the line, that's where we're gonna go, okay? So that's what we have with that. That's called the G2 phase. And so then we end up going from what we call the mitosis phase, which going from the interphase into mitosis or the M phase. And this is where we start to see the cells, one cell starts to become two and starts to divide. You know, this little picture up here shows a little bit of everything. This is the prophase right here. These two cells right here are in prophase. Instead of having, if you look at this cell right here, that's a normal cell, that's just sitting there normal. That's an interphase, that's interphase, that's interphase, that's interphase. All these are, most of these are interphase cells, you know? But we start to see, start to see the nucleus look a little different. And those clumps start to look a little bit different because what's happening is the, is these, is the, is the chromatin is gonna to start to organize into that chromosomal dyad configuration that we have, okay? And then we go through other phases and let's, we'll, we'll just go through those individually, okay? So let's talk about prophase. What happens in prophase? Again, the chromatin condenses, okay? Instead of having that amorphous granular looking nucleus, now all of a sudden we start to see chromatin start to form, start to come together, okay? And what happens is it coils, the, the chromatin coils into the chromosomes and now, instead of being an amorphous granular appearance, we start to see clumps appearing in the nucleus, which is basically a chromatin starting to come together to form those typical dyad structure. By dyad, what I mean is I have two parts come together, okay? And these, are these two parts are called sister chromatids. So let me just draw it a different color here, okay? Here's one sister chromatid. Here's the other sister chromatid sitting right there. And what they do is they have what's called the central portion right here, which is called the centromere. Okay, so I have two sister chromatids with a centromere. They're joined together in that particular X shape, and that X shape is called dyad. Okay, and what happens is a couple other things are going on at the same time. Well, the chromosomes are getting ready for the march. Okay, getting ready for the dance. What happens is the nucleol the nucleolus disappears. The nucleolus all of a sudden you don't see it anymore. You know, so when you see a cell, there's no nucleolus, it's gone, okay, it's, go, it's, it's disappeared. We also find the nuclear membrane disappears. So that nuclear membrane starts to go away as well, okay? So we lose the nuclear membrane and the nucleolus is gone, okay? And that's what we see in the early portion of prophase. And this is a picture, let me just get rid of my little dyad drawing right here. This is just showing a nucleus. And what you see is that's all, all the little blue squiggles in there. That's all that uh, that uh, uh, chromatin is starting to come together to be able to form that eventual dyad structure that we see and that, that will occur towards the end of prophase. Okay. Again, we also find something else will occur. Now, just around the outside of the nucleus, and we talked about this very briefly when we talked about the about organelles, is is what 
we, there are things, there, there, there's things called centrosomes, okay? The centrosomes, okay? And the centrosome is basically, um, there's two of them, okay? And what happens is they're usually, usually on both sides of the nucleus. So it's like, almost like right angles to each other, something like that. What happens is from the centrosomes, we develop these centrioles, okay? And these centrioles we talked about were, were microtubules, okay? And these microtubules will develop. And what they're going to eventually do is they're going to create these spindles that will be going across. Let me just draw that in a different way. Let me just get, get rid of this. Let me draw it with something with a more a fine pen, okay? They start to form these spindles that will go along. And we go from one uh, um, uh, one area, you know, a spindle in this kind of a spindle like that from between, okay? And again, those micro those are microtubules, okay? And those are the, the that's what comes from the, the centrioles to will do that, okay? Again, it starts out close to the nucleus, and it, it's close to the nucleus. Why? Because then what happens is whether on the opposite sides of the nucleus, I could take these chromosomes that are starting to form, and eventually in, an, in a later phase, they're going to line those chromosomes right down the middle, okay? So basically what happens is, is that's what we see with the, that occurs in prophase, okay? Uh, and as they separate, they move to the opposite sides of the cell. So now we've got a, a part of the spindle over here, part of the spindle over here with the microtubules. They're going on either side, and that we form a, a production of a spindle from pole to pole. So here's one pole here, here's the other pole here. It goes across that way, and that's what happens in prophase. So just sort of like to, to tell you a little about, again, to, to review what happens in prophase, the chromosomes start to condense and become visible, which we didn't see in the in the interphase, okay? Uh, we see these uh, spindle fibers, uh, which are basically the uh, centriole starting to appear, okay? From one centromere to the other, uh, or excuse me, from, from uh, one centrosome to the other centr cent centrosome, and these spindle fibers will collect, connect the two, and they start to stretch outwards towards the sides of the, of the, of the, uh, of the cell itself, okay? Uh, the nuclear envelope goes away, the nucleolus, the nucleolus disappears, and we're ready to go into our next phase. Okay, our next phase after that's called metaphase. Okay, now if we look up in here and look at these spindles, here are those spindles again. You know, those microtubules are like this, they're coming across. And so, what happens is, uh, so the, what, what will happen in, in this phase is the chromosomes start to line up along the center portion of all those microtubules in that spindle. And we can see that in the picture up here. We see all, here's the here's where the nucleus was. The nuclear membrane is pretty much gone at this point. And what happens is you can see all this, all the, all the, the, the chromosomes starting to line up right in the middle of that spindle, okay? Now, in the middle of that spindle, right in the middle of the spindle, they're connected, the chromosomes are connected, you know, uh, to these microtubules by what are called kinetochores. And the kinetochore is a little protein that connects the, cent the centromere. Again, we talked about the X dyad. The centromere would be right there of the chromosome to that area right along the middle of that spindle. Okay. Now, the reason why we have these kinetochromes is because what's going to eventually happen is these spindles are going to start to pull. And when I have the center, okay, that centromere of the chromosome attached to the kinetochrome, what's going to happen is one over here is going to pull this way and one this is going to pull this way and eventually I'm going to end up with two sister chromatids that are going in the opposite direction. This one's getting pulled towards this pole and this one's going to get pulled towards this pole. Okay so if we look up in here at this top picture up at the top so what happens is I can see my let me get rid of my crazy lines here. If I could see I have that dyad structure There'll be, there'll be kinetic cores they're attaching, and it's going to pull this sister this way, this sister this way, this sister, this chromatid that way, that chromatid this way, that chromatid this way, that chromatid this way. And actually what happens is it'll do this to each one of those, all those chromosomes after replication. So as a result, what happens when the cell divides, they'll have a full complement of chromosomes on each side. Okay, so that's what happens in metaphase. Okay, so these, so what we what we find again in, in, in the big thing in metaphase is these chromosomes will line up along the equatorial plane of the cell. Okay, so they line up in a line along that equatorial plane as you see up in here. Okay, and then what happens? We start to see a separation of the daughter chromosomes or the daughter chromatids. They're pulled apart at that centromere, which has central circle where it holds the two two sister chromatids together. Okay, so. We, have, so we start out with a sister, oh, let me do it. sister chromatid here, sister chromatid here, okay? I had right in the middle, 
okay the centromere holding it together okay and the uh, kinetochrome is going to attach okay, excuse me kinetochore is going to attach here and here it's going to pull it this way this way so all of a sudden now what's going to happen is eventually going to have that one sister chromatid this way and you have the other sister chromatid going this way each of them going towards the opposing pole of the, of the cell and that's eventually what's going to happen so that's what happens in metaphase they line up and get ready to go they start to pull okay this is just another picture this is just another looking at the nucleus and we're seeing all the chromosomal material lined up here's that center line that equatorial plane that's right there you can see all the chromosomes lined up along that they're going to start to be pulled by the kinetic core going this way and this way and in opposite ways okay to go to different poles next phase we have is called anaphase anaphase and in anaphase what happens is again the kinetic core continues to pull okay and here's one pole here's the other pole so these sister chromatids get pulled this way these sister chromatids get pulled this way okay so they're going you know this is early how they're starting to get pulled apart this is late how they're getting pulled even further towards okay and they're pulled along that spindles and those little spindles you know um, uh, basically from those microtubules that we talked about a little bit before okay so the sister chromosomes okay or chromatids actually are pulled towards the opposite poles so now part of them go here, part of them go that way. And that's what happens in anaphase. And we're starting to see that up here at the top picture, okay? If I look at the top picture, here's early anaphase. And you can see, here's this, you can actually look, if you look really close on the picture, you see all the spindles going across there? Okay, here's one pole, here's the other pole, here's one pole, here's the other pole. And what's gonna happen is the kinetic core protein on the spindle is gonna start to pull. And that's going to go this way this is going to go this way and as a result what happens they get pulled apart so now you see the gap where basically the gap was right here now the gap is getting bigger because half are being pulled one way half are being pulled the other way in in preparation for that cell division okay and that's what we see basically looking at an interface we're starting to see here's one pole here isn't the pole here and we're starting to see these sister chromatids being pulled in opposite or these chromosomes being pulled in opposite directions Okay, and now we're, we're getting really close. It's almost down to that point where that cell could say, okay, now I want to be two, okay? We get to what's called telophase, okay? And telophase is going to be the last stage of my mitotic phase. Well, it's sort of the last stage, okay? It still has to con continue a little bit. And what happens is now the chromosome sets reach the pole and they stop moving, okay? So now all of a sudden, here's one chromosome set, here's the other chromosome set. They've reached this pole and they reach this pole, okay? We'll find that at that point, a couple things are going to happen. Since the chromosomes now have that dyad structure, they're going to say, hey, you know what? The next thing that follows this is interface. Interface, we're not supposed to be together like that. We're supposed to spread out. So therefore, we could read that the genes off that. So what we find is the chromosomes at this point start to decondense. And they start to look more like the chromatin that we found earlier on, okay, in the interface period of time. So what happens, a nuclear membrane starts to form. The nucleolus reforms, okay? Now I have two nuclei. The cell is still not totally divided. I have a nu I'll have a nucleus here, I'll have a nucleus here. A nucleolus will form inside each of the nuclei. The nuclear membrane starts to form and the chromosomes stay, say, okay, now I'm where I'm supposed to be. Let's start to decondense. So those chromosomes decondense, again, become chromatin threads. We'll look at that granular material inside the nucleus. The, most, the mitotic spindle, all those microtubules will break down and then we continue into that cell division. Okay, so we've gone from one thing to the next to the next, and that's what it looks like now. Here's basically now the nucleus is starting to reform here. Nucleus is starting to reform here, but it's not that clumpy material. It's sort of, or not that linear material or the chromosome, but more of a clumpy appearance that's so very typical of the, um, of the chromatin that we talked about earlier. Okay, and that's what we're going to see in telophase. What happens, there's going to be a small part of time after that that is called with the cyto the final portion of cytokinesis is this cleavage furrow actually develops and separates the two daughter cells okay and you can see up here it's starting to form right here but here it's really formed now one cell has become this cell and has become this cell and they divided because this cleavage furrow continues what happens next we go back to interface and we start the process all over again Okay, same thing's gonna happen. And that's how cell division occurs. Now, one last thing I should mention about this, and you'll probably have to watch this a couple times to make sure that you got it all set. A couple things, okay? And I think it's important to understand this because, and put it in the uh, context of what this is all about, first of all. 
one thing is aging. It's a, it's a near and dear subject to me. You probably say what happens is we find some changes. Okay. What happens is that some of the cross linkages of proteins start to change. Okay. So as a result, maybe we were not quite as good as we were. There's a limited number of cell divisions. We don't divide cells nearly as much. So as we start, we start to lose things. When things start to uh, go through a certain attrition and die, guess what? After a certain point, they're not really replaced. We're not dividing these cells at the same level they were before. We also find with aging, there's also free radical damage. Okay, what do we mean by free radical damage? Um, we talked about this in a, one of the, our very, very, very early, probably the first video. What happens is environmental factors such as radiation, uh, toxins in the environment, inhalants, all kinds of stuff like that will actually cause cellular damage. They cause free radicals to form inside the cell. These free radicals like, uh, you know, uh, uh, peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, stuff like that, what they'll do, is, and superoxides, what they do is they damage the cell. They do it. They damage the, the, the DNA, okay? And as a result, what happens is once the DNA is damaged, what does it do? It means that some of those cells that have the DNA that's damaged, they don't produce the protein that they're supposed to. So therefore, they're a big mistake okay so as so that that's another thing that happens as we get older simply because we're exposed to these toxins through a longer period of time just by getting older also we find in older people there's an excessive immune response so what happens is sometimes you know everybody's always complaining of aches and pains and wear and tear and stuff like that some of that might just because of wear and tear of structures like in joints like the cartilage cartilage doesn't replace itself cartilage has very few cells so therefore what happens it it, it, it doesn't replace itself once it's gone it's gone okay but what happens in other places what happens is the immune response changes that what happens is it destroys more cells than what really needs to so it's exaggerated so also there are probably other factors involved in aging and talk about but aging does have a problem with cell division because cell division just doesn't occur nearly as much as it did before so we can't replace ourselves much as younger people can okay one other thing I just want to very briefly mention it has to do with cancer okay and what cancer and we've talked about this possibly a little bit earlier in the in the the semester okay in an earlier video is what happens is when we're exposed to all these toxins whether it be uh, um, uh, inhalants um, pollutants uh, medications uh, radiation all kinds of radiation not just x-rays but all kinds of radiation um, you look at the Sun we talk about uh, sunlight you know, uh, basically it causes damage to a lot of the ep uh, epidermal cells. It causes things like basal cell and squamous cell, car squamous cell carcinomas and stuff like that. Okay. What happens is radiation, uh, things that we eat, okay, uh, and other factors in our life. What they do is they frequently cause damage to the DNA and cause a genetic mutation. Okay. Now this becomes a problem because if we have a genetic mutation, the end product of that is what? Abnormal protein production. If I damage a gene, the protein that that gene was supposed to have the recipe for, it's like ripping a page out of the cookbook, okay, and you missed the, you know, five ingredients in the middle. Guess what? It's not going to be the same. So as a result, what happens over a period of time in a lifespan, uh, cells are going to change. They're going to, they're going to mutate. There's going to be some change because of all the factors that our bodies are exposed to day in, day out. Okay. As a result, these genetic mutations result in abnormal proteins that are produced where that area of mutation will be in the chromosome. Okay. So that creates, that could either be disease or it could actually cause certain types of cancers. Typical example, um, in breast cancer, uh, I, probably, I think I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. And, and um, it's, it's not just in breast cancer, there's other cancers, but we have two genes, they're BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. And these genes are surveillance genes. And they, what do they do is they produce proteins that, that, that surveil the body for abnormal cell divisions. And when there's abnormal cell divisions, what happens is these, these proteins that are produced have the option of doing one of two things, either uh, uh, repairing the uh, abnormal mutation, okay, and getting it back on track so we can make normal protein again, or destroying the cell if it can't. What happens is we find mutations that occur in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, therefore the surveillance system goes to pot doesn't work any well, doesn't work as well. And as a result, the incidence of developing certain cancers, i.e. breast cancer, is significantly increased when they have these gene, these gene mutations, okay? So gene mutations results in sometimes a loss of surveillance, or what happens is the gene mutation causes abnormal cell divisions and an error in reproduction. 
okay and if these errors in reproduction are not repaired or destroyed by body surveillance cells it results in uncontrolled cell division guess what cancer is cancer is uncontrolled cell division when they look at cancer cells underneath the microscope not only cancer cells look primitive they don't look like they're normal cells like they should be they look like they were way back you know um, again cells go through a series of maturation they look like a uh, an earlier type of cell that's not working and those cells don't work okay uh, so if I get go to a premature a, 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 a primitive cell or a pre or a cell that was earlier in that cell differentiating line guess what that cell is not prepared to do the work it's supposed to do okay what they also find in 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 cancer when they look at it under the microscope not only do they find cells that are disorganized not well coordinated uh, premature or primitive type cells but they would also find is they sell find this that cell division becomes uncontrolled they found multiple areas of mitosis if you were if we were in the lab and you were able to look <coughs> the cell box at cells it would be un extremely unusual, excuse me, extremely unusual for you to find cells where there's where they're dividing. You don't see them that much. OK, why? Even though we have many, 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 many cell divisions going on through my body all day long. Guess what? Catch to, catching one of them in a plane of, is very is a, is like needle in a haystack. OK, however, if you have a cancer, what's going to happen is you're going to find these cells not only look bad, not only look primitive not only are they disorganized but they also have lots of areas of division because cell division becomes uncontrolled they divide faster and they do that to try to replenish themselves so what happens is instead of going through that normal interface period of time holding them there in a holding pattern and getting right for a long time it goes through it faster okay and as a result they keep on replenishing what cells they replenish cancer cells the cancer cells will multiply and grow faster than the other cells and that's why they get bigger okay so anyway that's a little about uh, where, where cell division might be affected in both aging as well as in cancer